Let's welcome Lisa Getz out of the group here before I do the speech, because I have it broken down, but I'm just curious to know how many people are currently receiving disability, Social Security? Okay. And how many people are in the process of applying and getting rejected? Okay. And how many people are working and making money with an MS diagnosis? Okay. Hear it, I hear it loud. Okay. So I'm going to um, talk very briefly about patient rights, and then I'm going to talk about the ADA, which was a concern and something I was told to bring up, and then I can talk forever about what I do, but I'm going to keep it very concise to be able to answer questions and tell you a little bit about the overall picture. By patients' rights, um, I think you're your best advocate. I think if you need a caretaker, that's the best advocate. A journal, um, a, di a diary, those things are very, very, very important. For Social Security purposes, these things are considered evidence. Federal law will take any of this and, and consider a caretaker's testimony or a journal as long as you keep it and you write in it consistently. It could be once a month, it could be every day, but it has to be consistent. Um, you have a right to your medical records always. Sometimes that's an issue. I would always suggest you get your medical records when you're visiting your doctor. You ask them to make a quick copy for you, so you keep it on the side, because if anybody later needs the copies, they're going to charge you. So this way, they won't charge you if they just give you a copy of that day's records or that day's results. Um, with patients' rights, uh, one of the things that stood out was a doctor who received her doctorate degree in Harvard and went through th three doctors before she found some respect by the doctor. Doctors routinely run late. She found that when she was with these doctors, they didn't realize she was um, a medical doctor herself and she had gone to Harvard. It was in the Cambridge area and she found that the most important thing between a doctor-patient relationship is your rapport, your ability to get along, your ability to have somebody who's going to listen to you. And um, I would say that's probably the most important thing. She wrote an article that she put in um, the article's name, she put it on the MS perspective. It says, one woman with MS shares her perspective as both a patient and a doctor. And she really talks about it's a very personal issue. Deal with your doctor. Make sure you feel you're treated with respect. You're being looked at in the eye. You um, are listened to. And they are all going to keep you waiting, that she said. But in terms of making the effort of looking for other doctors if you don't feel that you're getting what you, what you should be getting from any doctor treating you. Because um, MS is really, really difficult, as I'm sure you guys all know, to diagnose, and uh, which carries into a lot of the issues that I see daily with MS. Um, but if you have that rapport with your doctor, that is invaluable. So with respect to patients' rights, you can go on and on. Um, what's the best interest? What personal questions you may have? Do you have a right to this and that? I'll pass that on when I talk about the Q&A sessions because patients' rights is um, an umbrella term that everybody uses uh, that may or may not apply. The ADA, does everybody know what ADA stands for? Okay, and it only really works or is um, 
is appropriate for any companies over 15 employees. So if anybody works for a small firm and they don't want to make reasonable accommodations like the ADA says, and they have less than 15 employees, you, you won't qualify under the EOC or you, can, you have no complaint. You, you don't have anything to hang your hat on when it comes to ADA. Also, if you have a claim for ADA, you cannot apply for Social Security Disability Benefits. You either say, yes, if you're, if, if you're contending that you can work, but you need special accommodations, that's completely contrary to saying you're disabled and you're not able to work and obtaining Social Security benefits. So there, it's kind of like a fork in the road. You have to decide, you know, if you're going to go towards ADA and they need to make accommodations for me and um, they're reasonable accommodations and they're more than 15 employees and you go that route, that's one way you can do it. But they're contrary because for Social Security Disability you're saying you cannot work. No matter what accommodations you give me, I'm not able to work substantially. I'm not able to do substantial gainful work activity. So as they're asking for ADA information, um, there are attorneys that only handle that. I don't. I know the attorneys that do. But you can't have an ADA claim or an EEOC complaint and be filing for Social Security Disability. Everybody get that? Like, and why? Okay. Same thing with unemployment. We're in a recession now. When you file for unemployment, you have to say that you're ready, willing, and able to work. And you have to do work searches. So this new breed of administrative law judges say, if you filed for unemployment, you don't qualify for disability. But that's not true. You, that's not true. That's, um, you could, you can, there are ways around it. And I think the most important thing is that being willing and able to work, being willing to work doesn't mean you're able to work. Being able to work doesn't mean you can work 40 hours a week consistently on a sustained basis. So there's a lot of different definitions that you can put into what is disabled, what isn't, what qualifies. And I can tell you for Social Security purposes and the Social Security Administration, then you have the short-term disability, the long-term disability, and all those are contingent upon the actual policy you bought when you signed up for that. So when you do with unemployment and you do your work searches, it's important to note that you will, and, and you will have a lot of slack from judges saying, well, you're saying you're trying to double dip. You're saying you're, you can't work, you're disabled. But then on the other hand, you're trying to find work and you sign the form saying you were willing and able to work. Contradictory, but there are ways around that. Um, because being desirous of working, needing a check from unemployment, I mean, those things are necessary. So you can argue against that. But in general, when you file for unemployment, and then for disability, know that the time period you're receiving your unemployment may disqualify you based on the new trend of judges. If you're lucky enough to have a judge who's been a judge for more than 10 years, um, they know that you can, you can double dip. But you have a lot of new judges that are very poorly trained, so I'm sorry, I should not have said that. But. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you, we have a bunch of new judges, which is great because they're trying to process the nationwide claims. However, uh, they don't really know the intricacies. They're just being told this is what you do. And until they come up on appeal, where you go all the way up to the federal district court and then you get a mandate from a federal judge, they don't really learn it until they go that route.
Um, or they gamble with you and they'll say, I'll give you benefits for a certain period of time, but I'm not going to give it to you for the whole time. So do you want, what is it, a bush? Some, do you, do you, what is, there's a saying, do you want the bush in hand or two? Okay, do you want something I can give you for sure today if you agree? I'll give you this, but I'm going to cut 18 months of your claim. So a lot of times people are like, uh, what do I do? So I advise it's based on a case by case, but as always, going back to patient rights, um, my suggestion is always the attorney should do what's best for you. Even if they cut you, if you need that help, that's more important um, for the sanity of your family and your caretakers. Um, so, ADA is a vocational issue. Patients' rights is a huge umbrella um, that can go in many different directions. And then with respect to the Social Security Administration, that's who we go up against every day and who I've gone up against for the last 20 years through a lot of different administrations. Um, one thing that I will say, anybody applying for Social Security Disability should get an attorney. Anytime anybody ever gives you a speech that you have a right to an attorney, you probably want to take that, you know, because they, it means they may be taking something away from you. And in this case, it's your, your entitlement, you know, if you're disabled. If you do look for an attorney, please ask what percentage of your practice deals with Social Security disability? Because there are a lot of people um, that will go forward and take cases, but they're not experienced. Or if you're going to a neurologist, you wouldn't be going to a chi chiropractor or to a cardiologist. So you have to think of lawyers are very specialized these days, and you have to think of it that way. Um, so that's my first recommendation for anybody looking to apply is definitely get yourself somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, we were talking earlier at the table, there are a lot of representatives that are not attorneys that also take cases. Some are wonderful and very, very experienced. Um, the problem with that lies that if you get denied, you can appeal only so much. Um, so you first have your initial claim. You file a, ba a claim for Social Security Disability um, in your local district office. Everybody's based on their zip code. Then you wait. Um, right now, the claims, because of fraud cases and the recession and more unemployment and more applications coming in, um, the delays have doubled. So it can be anywhere between two weeks to five months before you hear something on your initial case. If they deny you, and I have some statistics also to share with you about denial rates, um, they're very high to deny at initial claim. That's just standard. Because most people don't reapply or don't appeal it within the 60 days. So if you get denied at the initial level, you have 60 days to appeal it, and they give you five additional mailing days. If you get denied and you file a reconsideration, that's the next step, uh, a lot of paperwork comes out. If you have cognitive issues, if you have memory issues, if you have problems writing, that's why you hire somebody to do all that paperwork for you, because they get you on that. You don't turn in the paperwork, you don't fill in, you don't answer the questions, it's incomplete. And uh, that's the whole reason that you're applying, is because you can't do this kind of stuff. Um, if you get denied at the reconsideration level, which again, there's uh, most of the people that apply, they've, they've done studies that show half of them or more do not file an appeal. So there's no incentive really to pay you on the first go. Or they haven't been out of work for 12 months or the condition's not severe enough. 
So we're going to touch on those things. But either way, what you're looking at is, are you still disabled? Are you still unable to work? Then you go ahead and you file a request for hearing. That's your third level. That's still at the local area based on your zip code. And that uh, request for hearing is done, um, now it's called at an office called ODAR, Office of Adjudication and Review. It used to be known as um, OHA, Office of Hearings and Appeals. For some reason, everything's changing names. It's still the exact same thing. Um, but the forms had to be changed. So now known as ODAR, you have administrative law judges who um, listen to your hearing, and we can go through that if anybody hasn't gone or is nervous or doesn't know about the process. You have a whole hearing, and you, you get to see the judge face to face, and you're able to really let him see and hear how you feel, okay? Um, cases one at that level are very dependent on who's representing you, basically. Cases at that level are, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you really couldn't hear? Really? Okay, hi, my name is Lisa. <laughs> no, okay, um, when you go in front of a judge, it's, the win rate is based upon the person taking you in front of that judge. That's really where you want that experience and the expertise. Um, and it, the, the numbers vary nationwide. Um, we've been doing this 20 years and I'd say we have a very nice rate of return. I mean, that's why we do it. We don't always win at the hearing level though. Sometimes the judges will turn around and deny you, and then you have to go to the appeals council. That's another level. That level of the appeals council can still be handled by a non-attorney. The appeals council is just a brief, and in that brief you say where the mistakes were of the judge, where the judge should have listened or done and didn't. Um, if the appeal, and that appeal council level is taking two years or more to decide what they're doing with this. In the meantime, we used to be able to file a new application and try to condense them both. And the government, the federal government, has just changed that and prohibited us from starting a new claim. They're basically saying either you go with the appeal council and wait two years, or you file a new claim, but you're gonna lose that time. So again, that's an on, on an individual basis based on the individual circumstance, and uh, it takes a lot of review. If you go through the appeals council, the appeals council is located in Virginia. They take care of everyone regardless of their zip codes. Um, they have three options. They can read your brief. It used to be listen to a tape, now it's listen to a CD. They can remand the case, which is saying, okay, judge, you made these mistakes. You have to go back, have a hearing now, and when you have this hearing, you need to do A, B, and C. So that's called a remand. You get an opportunity for a hearing right away. They can reverse, which is say, oh, judge, you, you made a big mistake. This person qualifies, and we're going to go ahead and pay you the benefits. In 20 years, I think I've seen that three times. Um, or they can deny. They can say the judge did nothing wrong, and that's it. Then you have 60 days to go to federal court. Federal court in Florida is the Southern District of Florida. In Florida, they just did away with it, but you had to have been licensed in the Southern District of Florida in order to be able to present to court um, any case there. And um, now I understand any attorney can just sign a check, they can wave into South Florida. But it used to be that it was only you had to be certified in the Southern District Court, so we are. Um, and there you go in and you explain to a like-minded person who's not swayed 
necessarily, and you can talk and you can explain what the rules are and the regulations and the statutes and where the judge made mistakes of law. Based on that, that judge can do the same three things. Remand, send it back to a hearing. They can deny it or they can grant it. Um, some have actually granted it. Some U.S. judges, uh, federal magistrates have gotten letters of recommendation and have paid the case from federal court. That process um, takes about three to five years. Uh, you can have files, you file the fee through the Equal Justice Act, EJA fees. So whether you have the money or not to go into federal court, it's um, a constitutional right that you have and they will waive your fees if you don't have the income or the money or the resources to pay the filing fees in federal court. Um, okay, so th those are really the stages of how you can get your cases. At the initial, at the reconsideration, at the request for hearing level, the appeals council, or federal court. Um, the last two stages, that's where your zip code doesn't matter. Um, before that, it, it is, it depends on where you live and your population and how slow the process can be. Uh, in the last three to four years, they're, they're really speeding up. They're bringing cases um, from South Florida into Oklahoma or wherever there's nothing going on and you have judges that are just sitting around without work they're getting files that are from Florida, especially Dade County. So sometimes you'll, you'll say, why am I looking at something from Omaha or from wherever? These people will have your physical file and your medical records and they are determining whether or not you qualify. Um, they also ask you to waive your right to a hearing, sometimes to make a hearing not have to happen so that you can just use the medical records. Um, you've been denied based on your medical records. So I wouldn't ever waive the right to a hearing. It, it, it's silly because you, there's, unless there's something really new that is unequivocal, that you are life-threatened, that you're not making it, you do not waive your right to a hearing. You go in because you've been denied based on the medical records prior to that. Okay, different types of programs on their social security. I've heard here a lot of people use SSDI. Um, I'm afraid with that lingo because under social security disability insurance, there are a number of different programs. Um, there are programs for children qualifying as a disabled child under their parents' account, their programs as an insured worker, which is a Title II program. Their programs as a Title 16, which is SSI. If you don't have enough quarters of coverage you, and you meet the poverty guidelines, you still qualify. It's the same medical issues that they're looking at. That just includes income. Then there are programs for disabled widows. There's programs um, for survivors. All of these programs fall under the SSDI category. So when I refer to Social Security Disability, I'm talking SSI, DIB, children's, widows, a little bit of everything. And they all have their own um, conglomerate of rules. So that's very case specific also. Um, but just so that you know, the programs have a lot of different sub-programs. Um, then they also, uh, social security doctors. Everybody has an issue with social security doctors. Um, why do I have to go to a social security doctor to be examined? Because it's just protocol, because it just is. And you do, because you just do. You go. If you can't afford it, you can say, I need a cab to take me, and they have to provide it. It's a violation of due process not to. Um, but you go through that, and chances are the doctor will not evaluate you, and chances are the doctor will say, you're fine, you can work. And that'll be it. But it's 
just a method to their madness. Um, the definition of social security disability is having an inability to do substantial gainful work activity for a period of 12 months or more. Okay, those months have to be consecutive. Um, you will have people at the Social Security office say, um, sorry, but when did you last work? Oh, last week, last month. You have to be out of work for a year. I can't do anything for you. Well, the definition says a year, but that year starts the minute you stopped working. And it can work its way through the process. So whenever you file for Social Security disability, they will try, or they can try to tell you, go home, and if you're still out of work in a year, come back and apply. Don't, because you don't know if you go back to work in five months, you let that application go, that's fine. But if you do need it, at least it's running, it's time clock. So don't wait a year of being out of work to file. Um, remind me that with this, there's something in the Q&A session that I'd also like to say, um, because it's as important when you apply and how you apply. Uh, caretaker testimony, journals or diaries, extremely important, because um, with MS, as MS especially, um, you have a lot of activity of daily living limitations. And we take it for granted what we can do, what we can't. And it's um, a humiliating process to go through disability. And to be able to tell someone that you don't know or fill out a form and, or keep a diary and write, I couldn't open a, a jar today or, you know, I had a problem getting out of bed just to go to the bathroom, or I soiled myself, or I'm having, those things are very, very important because unless they're consistently written in a journal or a diary, or you're keeping track of your feelings and emotions, you can't go in front of a judge and say you have all this stuff happening because unless it's supported by a medical doctor, they don't have to hear you, and that's not a mistake on their part. So a lot of doctors don't write these detailed informations or you see them once a month, but what happens on the other 29, 30 days of the month? You, you want to keep a recording because it is considered evidence. So you want to keep track of how you're feeling. Um, really, really important. What is considered, we call it SGA, substantial gainful work activity. Um, SGA for 2011 was $1,000. If you made $1,000 in one month, you cannot apply for Social Security Disability because that's considered substantial gainful work activity. For 2012 was $1,010. And for 2013, it's going to go up to $1,040 a month. There are ways around it. That's one thing that the Q&A session may help you with. But um, that money means as long as you're making that money, you're working. And you cannot apply for Social Security Disability. You don't qualify because you're working. Now, in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, you had a lot of people that mid-90s even, that could pick up the phone and make a phone call to their stockbroker and sell a couple stocks. And in that one phone call, because they made that phone call and sold the stock, if they made over this amount, they would not qualify for disability benefits. It was considered work. And it was. You picked up the phone, you generated that income, you worked. Okay, so that's how they're looking at it, and it's that detailed. Um, then there's also a trial work period. Has anybody heard of that term here? When you're on disability benefits, there are trial work periods where you could try to work to see if you get better. 
um, and they're looking at nine month maximum over a period of 60 months, six zero months. So um, trial work periods are also an issue that people review you for with Social Security. Anybody who needs to know anything about that, Q&A session is a great place. Um, if anybody needs to file for Social Security benefits, again, the first paper you fill out will be forever kept in these federal files. So you really, again, if you're going to hire an attorney on the 30th day or on the first day, it really doesn't matter because the attorney gets paid the same amount. It's statutory, it's federal law, and we're capped at 6,000 max. Um, with several exceptions depending how many years the case takes, but it's, um, it's really meant to, doesn't promote a lot of attorneys in the field. So you want to make sure that your attorney only does this. You want to make sure if you file on your own and you call the Social Security 1-800 number, you ask for what's called a protective filing date. And that protective filing date says basically you are disabled as of the date you place that phone call. The reason that's very important is because they're so backlogged and delayed. If they take your application, they actually do it for you or help you with it three months later, your protective filing date is the date you place that phone call. You don't lose those three months. So those are little things to avoid delays in getting benefits. Um, you have also questions when it comes to keeping things on the computer. You, all those things go into your exertional and your non-exertional, what you can do physically, what you're not able to do physically. So um, they, they look at everything Social Security does. They do not, however, look at um, alternative sources of treatment, if you're on herbal supplements, if you're on um, complementary uh, prescription drugs, they don't really look at that. They look at your treatment notes, your notes of your neurologist, the notes of your rheumatologist if you have one, your ophthalmologist, they're really looking for MDs and they're looking for objective medical records which because if it is MS, unless you have an MRI, the way that the doctors were saying, it's very hard to pinpoint and prove that this is what you have. And um, you can get benefits any number of different ways. They can say you have fibromyalgia, they can say you have chronic fatigue, so they can say you have major depression. There, there's a lot of different ways to get benefits. And um, there is a listing for MS and there is a category for it. But still, you have to have documented objective medical evidence. There's no way around that. Um, you have to do your due diligence, which means find those doctors that take care of you. Um, the hardest thing is getting treatment if you have no money, no income, no insurance. Uh, UN, Jackson, and Dade is great. Any public hospital has to treat you but they only treat you based on the severity of your case. So if you don't have a private physician to take notes and keep notes for you, um, you must go to the emergency room and you must have it documented. Absent medical documentation, you're never gonna win a social security case. Um, there were um, some compassionate allowances. Has anybody heard of that term? Okay, uh, there are certain times that the government will see a case and it's so obvious that they're disabled that they'll go ahead and pay the case. And MS can be one of those, but you have to be very, very severe. They'll go ahead and pay your benefits while they're still deciding if you're really disabled or not. You've got to be real careful if you know anybody who's doing that because if they decide you're not disabled, you're going to be charged with an overpayment and then you're going to freak out and say, oh my God, I thought I got it so easily and now I have to pay back 
all this money for the last 13 months to Social Security. How does that work? So nothing comes free. Just keep that in mind. Always seek advice. Um, that's the best advice I can give you. And find advice from somebody who's not a fellow patient. That somebody who works doing whatever the advice you need is, that's what they do. Um, there is a listing under Social Security that is specific to MS. It's a very hard listing as an attorney to win um, because it talks about your functional capacity, your consistency. There's a lot of forms that need to be completed. Um, you have to have really perfect notes from your doctors. A lot of them write very ineligible. Um, that's one of the things the judges love to throw out, but by law they have to transcribe them. I mean, you can be said you don't have something if you have medical records showing you have something. Um, so that's one of the re ways to bypass is really to keep a journal, keep a diary, keep a calendar, keep something that talks about your fatigue, your complaints. Huge, huge, huge. Um, for the level of impairments, they need um, disorganization of a large motor function. Motor function is what it says. Large is really what it must be because um, if you have a tremor, it won't be the same as having a difficulty ambulating and walking. Those things are very descriptive on the listing. The listing also talks about visual acuity. You need um, to be evaluated by an ophthalmologist. That's a whole other issue, but it falls under the listing of MS. And then you have um, mental problems. And then is it organic, cognitive, because of the incapacity of MS? Or is it depression, or is it somatic, which means it's in your mind, it's really not there. All these things have to be clinically supported. Um, and, and I mean, you do get a successful claim based on that. But they do look at um, the listing. The listings, a lot of times we fall very attuned to our diagnosis. I have this, and this is why I should get disability. And really, it's a combination of impairments, because MS is not one impairment. It's a combination of impairments put together, where it's making you feel all these different things at different times. Um, so that's pretty much a breakdown Social Security process to get benefits for anybody who's applied. It will take, at a minimum, the fastest claim I've ever seen has been three weeks, but it was a heart transplant case. Um, other than that, I think another fast case is eight to 12 weeks. After that, you're really, really looking at 12 to 18 months to be done with Social Security um, routinely. It can take up to five, six years um, if you have to go all the way up to federal court, uh, it can even take a little longer than that. Um, they do have, Social Security has created, um, they call it ERE, electronic record something, and it's where now different attorneys can have satellite offices in their office. So in our office, for example, we have a camera, a TV, and we take hearings nationwide from Hawaii, Alaska, Puerto Rico, anywhere um, from our office. You need to be certified by the administration to be able to do that. Um, but what it helps is it helps in funneling the cases a little quicker you can get hearings in different places. The judges can disallow it, and they can make you appear in person. Um, there are pluses and minuses to appearing in video. Depends on the judge, depends on the jurisdiction you're in. Um, but there are ways that the government's trying to speed up the cases. You don't always want to speed it up if you just stopped working, though, because you can speed it up, and if you don't have those 12 months, it's an automatic denial. 
So that, that's pretty much the spectrum of Social Security disability. It's huge. Um, very few practitioners nationwide that only do this. Um, and our practice is really limited to this. We also do tax work because of my husband, but this is something that, that's a feel-good law. It, it really makes a difference. It impacts people's lives. It's very frustrating to see how hard it is sometimes. Um, but I would say that if you do what you have to do, your part, due diligence, go to your doctor, there's no reason you shouldn't qualify for it. Now that Obama won the election, everything may change again. It may make it better because everybody may be able to obtain better medical records now. Um, it may make it harder because you may have more people now applying also. So. I'm not really sure what's going to happen, but whatever goes on in Washington, D.C. affects locally anything that has to do with Social Security. It is a knee-jerk reaction. All the furloughs that have happened in the last 15, 20 years have affected us daily. Our cases, our hearings, our notices, it's very, very impactful. So um, that wraps it up for Social Security.